Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the public, staff, and council. Welcome to the public meeting of uh, Monday, May 16th. Uh, I'd like to have a mover uh, call the meeting to order. Moved by Councillor Lang, second by Deputy Mayor Jaworski. All those in favor of the motion, meeting is called to order. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Are there any additions, deletions, or amendments, Ms. Haley? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. Okay. And I get a mover for that. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Lang, second by Councillor Luck. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four, new business. For a temporary zoning amendment, Sheep's Head Bistro, Ms. Haley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before we get started this evening, I do want to read uh, required wording under the Ontario Planning Act. So this is a public meeting under Section 34 of the Ontario Planning Act. Any person may attend the public meeting and or make written or verbal representation, either in support of or in opposition to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at this public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the Township of South Glengarry before the bylaw is decided upon, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council to the Ontario Land Tribunal, also known as OLT. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the Township of South Glengarry before the bylaw is decided upon, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the OLT unless there are reasonable grounds to do so. So we are dealing with two different applications uh, this evening. The first one is known as Sheep's Head Temporary Use Zoning Bylaw Amendment. This property is located at Block 82, Registered Plan Number 142, in the Geographic Township of Charlottenburg, now in South Glengarry, uh, located at 18299 County Road 2 in the uh, settlement area of Glen Walter. This is a key map of the subject property. It is bordered by County Road 2 on the south side and Kilkenny on the uh, west side. Sheeps, uh, the subject property is currently developed uh, containing a structure that has a restaurant known as Sheep's Head on the ground floor and uh, four apartment units above the restaurant. And this is a um, street view of the subject property where you can see um, the existing structure, restaurant being on the main floor, the residential units above, and um, the, the parking area, and this side is Kilkenny Crescent, and you'll see an image of the parking lot, that, or the uh, patio that we are about to talk about. So in early 2000, the province of Ontario issued emergency orders under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, and later through the Reopening Ontario Act to address the issues that we were dealing with from the pandemic uh, with COVID-19. The patio order permitted restaurants to create or extend outdoor patios without requiring municipal planning approvals. This was done uh, in a creative way to allow businesses to hopefully function uh, during the pandemic um, while meeting separation distances and reduced uh, capacity requirements dictated by public health. On April 6, 2022 of this year, we received a notice from the province that the order was being lifted as of April 27th, 2022, and that previous approved patios would have to go through municipal planning approvals. Well, you can see that's not a lot of time. Given 21 days, it's really not a lot of time to reach out to property owners or restaurant owners that would be impacted, um, you know, figure out the planning approval process, deal with the application and, and process it accordingly. So we did uh, reach out to the restaurant Sheep's Head owner and uh, worked through to see what their request would be if they wanted to continue having their patio on the spot or at the space, I should say, uh, to be used as they were permitted to do so in previous years. So the purpose of this temporary use zoning amendment is to permit the placement of a 13 foot by 23 foot temporary patio to be used as an outdoor commercial patio between May 1st and October 31st for food service of the patrons of the existing restaurant. As we mentioned, the patio was, was placed and used on this property in 2020 and 2021 and was permitted by the province of Ontario. If this bylaw were to be, a pa to be passed, the effect of the passing of the amendment will permit the outdoor commercial patio on the subject property for the duration of up to three years from the date of passing of the bylaw if the bylaw is approved. The placement of the patio results in the loss of two parking spaces. 
An agreement has been entered into between the owner of the restaurant and Precious Blood Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is located um, not far east of the subject property at 18320 County Road 2. And the church parking lot can be used for the employees and the patrons of the restaurant. This agreement was in effect in 2020 and 2021. I believe the space was used. And um, to my knowledge, we had received uh, no complaints regarding the use of this space or any concerns. This is um, a, a site plan of the subject property. And you can see in here, the location of the patio is here. We saw the street view a few slides back where we were looking north uh, into the property where you saw the patio in front of, or almost in front of the entrance of the, uh, the restaurant. The subject property is designated residential district in the county official plan, and it's located in the Glenwalter Urban Settlement Area. The proposed zoning amendment does conform to the official plan. It also is consistent with the provincial policy statement 2020, and the subject property is zoned core commercial in our township zoning bylaw. The United Counties of SDNG Transportation Department, um, as well as all abutting property owners within 120 meters of the subject property were circulated on this application notice. And to date, I've received no written or verbal comments from the public. And uh, there's been no uh, comments or concerns brought forward from the United Counties. In fact, we worked with the United Counties in 2020 when the uh, patio was first brought on to make sure that they had no concerns with um, the reduction in parking. So um, it's intended to bring a staff report uh, with a recommendation uh, to Council at the June 6, 2022 Council meeting. And again, if the bylaw is approved, Council can continue to grant extensions to the bylaw for periods of not more than three years each. So in dealing with the, um, the property owner, the property owner was saying that uh, the three years would work nicely. It would give him a chance to really kind of understand what the, the clientele needs are, maybe outside of a pandemic, hopefully. And one thing to point out is that the restaurant has um, a noted capacity, meaning that it can only accommodate so many patrons based on the size of the restaurant, the washroom facilities, and um, the meeting the requirements of the Ontario Building Code. So they're capped at 30 individuals. In order to have their liquor license um, also to be available on the patio space, they still can't ex exceed serving 30 people because the washroom capacity is not changing in the interior. So at the end of the day, whether they're seating 30 individuals inside or a combination of individuals inside or outside, really the ability to create more customers is capped because of the limitations of the restaurant size. So we don't see a big change um, in terms of you know, a lot more people attending to the site and creating this, this big parking issue. So that's all I have uh, for this application. I did speak with the property owner today. Um, unfortunately, he was going to do his best to meet the public meeting. There was, I think something came up where he had to be somewhere. So I did tell him that I would uh, send his regrets with council and, um, and I would do my best to answer questions if there were any. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, Ms. Haley. Are there any questions of the committee? Um, Ms. Haley, uh, you and I spoke briefly uh, before the meeting about this. Um, I th is there a way that this meeting doesn't have to so have to be held on an annual basis, or um, is there a way to delegate that authority to staff? Um, you know, I think since the post COVID, I think you know we realize how important these these outdoor uh, facilities are for a lot of our our local businesses. Is there something that can be done that it's a mere formality with staff? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the question. And um, the beginning of this year, we, we have seen several changes being made to the Ontario Planning Act. And one of the changes made to the Ontario Planning Act is delegating approval authority to administration for temporary use bylaws. And basically, that's the province's goal is to reduce the red tape. In order for us to be able to uh, deal with this at administrative level, the official plan needs to be amended to establish those policies within the official plan that grants the delegating authority and then we would bring a delegating authority bylaw to council uh, that would delegate administration to, to grant them. And um, we do know that the county is, is aware of these changes and will be working on an official plan amendment to accommodate all of the changes in the Ontario Planning Act that would then give us different flexibilities in in many different aspects. 
Okay, great. Good. Thank you for that explanation. Seeing no other questions, we'll move on to the next portion of the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. So our second uh, application this evening is to deal with a South Hungary zoning bylaw housekeeping amendment that's been initiated by administration. So I'm going to explain to you what a housekeeping amendment is. This is the first time we've done one with this council. So the purpose of an, a housekeeping amendment is basically to create new general provisions as needed, clarify wording to create a more user-friendly document, remove provisions that are no longer needed or enforced, and make corrections in the text and or zoning schedules. And those are just a, a few examples, but the main examples. The purpose of our housekeeping amendment that we'd be dealing with this evening is to create new general provisions for agritourism, create general provisions for poultry, revise yard encroachments pertaining to exterior cladding, reduce parking requirements for mini warehouse and storage uh, uses, revise special setbacks for county roads, revise special setbacks for water courses pertaining to docks and boathouses, introduce new definitions, and changes to the zoning schedules for specific properties to correct uh, technical errors. So I'm now going to walk through all the changes that are being proposed. Some of these changes will, will be familiar to Council because we prevent, presented them uh, to you in the past to gain your um, direction. So the first one we're going to deal with is agritourism. So agritourism is defined broad, broadly and it generally involves any agriculturally based operation or activity that brings visitors to a farm. The new definition that's being proposed to support the agritourism general provisions in the township zoning bylaw will be agritourism means the use of land, building or structures for accessory use to the principal agricultural use of the lot conducted for gain or profit to support, promote and sustain the viability of the agricultural use, including but not limited to agricultural education and research facilities, alternative accommodations, restaurants, farmers markets, and the retail of local artisan and farm products, pick your own facilities, farm mazes, and special events. We also introduced a new alternative accommodation uh, definition, and this means an agritourism use where the use of a temporary building or structure not attached to the main dwelling on the lot that is operating or offering a place of short-term overnight for any period of 30 consecutive days or less throughout all or any part of a calendar year. Alternative accommodations may include a detached secondary dwelling unit, cabins, yurts, tree houses, or other similar buildings or structures. It does not include a bed and breakfast establishment, recreational vehicle, mobile home, or camping trailer. The reason why it doesn't include a bed and breakfast establishment is because it's already a permitted use in the rural and agricultural zone, so we don't limit it, it just isn't part of an alternative accommodation because a bed and breakfast is part of your dwelling, your, your home. Um, recreational vehicles, mobile homes, or camping trailers are found to be approved in approved campsites, not on uh, individual properties. Oops, sorry. Uh, another definition that's being introduced to support agritourism would to deal with wineries and cideries. So means the use of land, buildings, structures, and equipment for the making of wine from fruit grown primarily on the premises, including fermentation, storage, and aging, and may include storage, display, processing, wine tasting, a tied house license by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, or applicable licensing authority, and retail administrative facilities and outdoor patio areas. So, to introduce the general provisions of the bylaw, uh, the following provisions will now be added. Uh, that the primary use of the subject property must be an agricultural use. You really can't have agritourism if you're not farming because what are you um, promoting? What are you creating a tourist uh, opportunity for without a farm? So the other item is, is alternative accommodations are permitted within an accessory building such as a secondary dwelling unit, cabins, yurts, tree houses, providing they conform to the Ontario Building Code with a maximum of 20 overnight guests per property. If plumbing facilities are installed to serve the alternative accommodations, they shall be serviced with an appropriate on-site sewage system as per the Ontario Building Code and all accessory buildings used for alternative accommodations shall be included in the maximum lot coverage. So I'm going to explain that um, a, a little bit. So first of all, uh, when you construct either a secondary dwelling unit, a cabin, a yurt, or a tree house, and they're used for human occupancy, they do require a permit under the Ontario Building Code. That's uh, the purpose of that reference. When we discussed agritourism with council in the past, which is quite some time ago, 
we uh, sought your direction as to what you were looking for in terms of the number of people per site. You know, did we, we talked about limiting it to five. We talked about, you know, do you want to have an unlimited number? And the number of a maximum of 20 overnight guests per property was, was recommended. This allows the properties to remain rural, um, still accommodate a substantial number of guests, but not change the character of the area or the abutting property owners that they're going to be concerned that an abundance of people are moving in and you know creating noise or, or changing the rural character of the property. Um, the other item that's listed on here that I'd like to explain is if plumbing facilities are installed. So for example, you could have a treehouse or a cabin or a yurt that doesn't have any plumbing facilities and it wouldn't need an, an on-site sewage system. And so you could have an outhouse, for example, and the building code will regulate where and when that's possible. But if you're introducing uh, hand washing facilities, any anything that would produce gray water, it automatically triggers the on-site sewage system. So depending on the property owner and what they want to do and create an offer to their guests, they may be able to get away without a system, they may require a system. So we would work with those individual property owners uh, to meet their needs. To continue those provisions, uh, we also uh, talked about where, what we would cap um, the, the different operations or spaces on the property. So for example, a retail space shall not exceed a thousand, excuse me, a hundred square meters of gross floor area. And that equates to 1,076 square feet. So you can actually have a decent retail space, a retail store at a thousand square foot that would be able to hopefully accommodate, you know, either your products, your, your anything that's produced uh, on the farm. And then a winery or cidery is permitted and it must be licensed by the Alcohol Gaming uh, Commission of Ontario. That's a requirement of the province. And um, the fruit used in the production of the wine or cidery shall be predominantly from the vineyard or fruit grown on the same land as the farm winery or as part of the farmer's owner own farm operation. You'll notice we don't say it has to be, we just say predominantly. And you may recall uh, during the pandemic, the province was looking at making amendments to their regulations that would provide flexibility to um, fruit growers that they could also sell their products elsewhere or they could bring them to other places. Well, our amendment will allow that because it doesn't say, in, you know, has to be grown on that property. All retail and restaurants uh, must be serviced by an appropriate on-site sewage system, and that's simply because it's an Ontario Building Code requirement. You can't have uh, a retail space or a restaurant without having um, water or, or sewage uh, services. And existing agricultural structures may be converted to accommodate agritourism facilities by providing a change of use permit and um, a building permit are obtained um, through the Ontario Building Code. So to give you an example, if you have taken, you have a, a barn on your property that you now want to convert into your education center or you want to change into, um, you know, maybe a, an area for students for a day camp, we have to make sure that that facility is now accessible, um, handicap accessible. We have to make sure that that facility is serviced to accommodate those guests. And typically a barn is designed for a terminology they use called a low human occupancy. I believe it's intended for approximately two people. Well, once you're changing that facility to bring in multiple people, you just go through the change of use permit process under the building code to ensure that it's um, meeting the requirements of the code. So now I'm going to move on to poultry because poultry has been a discussion that's, uh, that's happened for a few years. And as you know, we've been wanting to bring this housekeeping amendment to address it. So we've had to make a few changes in the bylaw to be able to accommodate where we could have um, backyard chickens. So poultry is being defined as uh, meaning domestic fowl, such as chickens, hens, turkeys, quail, ducks, and geese, but does not include roosters. I think it's obvious why we didn't include roosters. Roosters are not always appreciated by every neighbor. We definitely get some complaints on, on roosters that are, are located on a non-farm property or a, a, a smaller farm property. Uh, livestock means dairy, beef, swine, poultry, roosters, horses, goats, sheep, ratites, fur-bearing animals, deer, and elk, game animals, birds, and other animals as defined by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. So those two um, uh, definitions, uh, the poultry definition is being introduced, the livestock uh, definition is being amended in our bylaw. So the general provisions being added to the bylaw to accommodate poultry 
shall be permitted within the rural and agricultural zones on all properties having less than 2.5 hectares or 20 hectares, so 2.5 in the rural zone, 20 hectares in the agricultural zone of land and shall comply with the following provisions. Poultry is permitted providing the property is developed containing a single detached dwelling. Poultry is not permitted on vacant land that is less than 2.5 hectares in the rural zone or 20 hectares in the agricultural in, uh, area. And poultry is permitted on properties with single detached dwellings only. Poultry is not permitted on properties with semi-detached dwellings, a duplex, a townhouse, having less than 2.5 hectares in rural or 20 hectares in, in agricultural. So I'm going to explain this a, a little bit um, to, to hopefully make it easily understood. So currently, if you don't own more than 2.5 hectares, which is 6.14 acres in a rural zone, you can't have chickens. We all know that 6.14 acres is a large enough lot to be able to accommodate chickens without negatively impacting your well and uh, your neighbor's well. So if this amendment is approved, poultry is now going to be permitted on any sized property in the rural zone on less than 2.5 hectares. However, we do want that property to contain a dwelling because you just don't want uh, chickens roaming, ar roaming around on a one acre vacant lot or a half acre vacant lot. They have to be cared for and they have to be fed. And then the same goes in the agricultural area. This does not stop though a chicken farmer from having you know, a barn and chickens on it. This is dealing with, um, with kind of backyard chicken or backyard or poultry. And then um, we also, if you notice here, we will allow poultry on a property with single detached dwellings, but not on properties with semis or a duplex or a townhouse. And that's because you could have a semi that are units side by side. One homeowner on one unit wants chickens, the other ones don't, and the chickens have now crossed in the backyard and they're now on someone else's property. And it's just not fair to the people that have um, the semi or the, uh, the duplex. If such thing, we have neighbors that come forward that are in agreement and they want to be able to do that, they can always apply for a minor variance. On a positive note, we have very few semi-detached dwellings or duplexes in the rural zone. They're primarily single detached dwellings, so you're not going to see this request come forward very often. You're going to see semis or duplexes in more of our settlement areas where they're not permitted. And again, we sought direction from uh, council on this. To continue the provisions that are being proposed, that we would have a maximum of 10 poultry permitted per property, that pens or chicken coops uh, are permitted and shall be located a minimum of 1.2 meters from rear and interior side property lines. That's the same setback as an accessory structure. And um, they're to be located in the rear or side yards and shall meet the minimum front yard setback and exterior yard setback. So a typical front yard setback in a rural and agricultural zone is 15 meters. So we don't necessarily want chicken coops to be in the first you know, five meters of someone's front yard. We want them to be in the side or the rear yards. And we don't want them to be on the exterior side yard because that could be too close to the road where you're maintaining a corner or something to that effect. If pens and coops are greater than 10 square meters, an approved building permit is required as per the Ontario Building Code. And we've also um, made some corrections in the 10.2 section of our bylaw to make sure it's consistent that they would be permitted. Um, so now I'm going to get into other amendments that are being proposed just really to improve the bylaw to make it be much more user friendly and I can give examples. The first one is, is yard encroachments. So what we're proposing is that exterior cladding, such as but not limited to stucco, siding, brick, or stone be permit, may be permitted to project not more than 100 millimeters in the front side or rear yard. So I wanna explain this. We've had several properties in either our waterfront or in hamlet areas that don't meet setbacks. They wouldn't meet a six meter front yard setback. If a property owner wanted to remove their existing siding and modify their structure to add in brick or stone, you're now maybe adding, you know, an inch or so or a couple of inches to that property line, to that, to that main wall, I should say, that's now encroaching into the front property line that would trigger a minor variance. And it seems really redundant or it seems very difficult to explain to the public that we're actually going to make them go through a zone, uh, excuse me, a minor variance. <coughs> for an inch or two, just because they've decided to improve their property. 
with this amendment, we'll never require a zoning amendment, and it's thick enough or deep enough to accommodate all the different types of exterior claddings out there, so we're not triggering this. I don't believe our, um, I believe our former committee of adjustment actually dealt with this where there was conflicts between abutting property owners and the abutting property owners forced us to do the variance because they were changing the exterior cladding. So hopefully this will, will avoid that, that situation. Um, oops, I think I need to go back. Oh no. Okay. So another area that uh, we're proposing to change that actually came up earlier today in um, our committee of adjustment um, meeting is in regards to parking requirements for mini, uh, mini warehousing and storage. So um, parking and loading provisions is hereby proposed to be amended by adding, by, a by adding the following, industrial uses, warehouse bulk storage, bakery, dairy, dry cleaning plant in the chart. And what it'll do is it will allow for one space for each 100 square meters of gross floor area plus one space for 20 square meters of gross floor area for office use. That was difficult to say, sorry. So if I can use an example that came up earlier, we had a proposed mini storage that was going to require, I believe it was 24 parking spaces. And really, we know mini storages don't require a lot of parking at a lot of time because people are randomly attending to the site, picking up their belongings or dropping off their belongings. They're not staying there for a long period of time and they're leaving. With this amendment, it'll drastically reduce the requirements and it'll also bring it into um, consistency with, our, with some of our neighboring uh, municipalities. Another uh, amendment that's being proposed is really to clean up a section dealing with uh, setbacks on lots of budding a county road. So currently, anytime you're located on a county road, you have to be set back 30 meters from the center line of the road. That hasn't changed and it's not changing. But in our bylaw, we had a section where uh, the proposed building is to be built within 45 meters of an existing building. The setback uh, line may be adjusted. And the adjusted setback shall be no less than the setback of the existing building plus an additional distance equal to one third the clear distance between the existing building and the proposed building location. And in no case shall the setback line be less than three meters from the nearest limit of the county road. And it references a bylaw from the United Counties. Well, that bylaw is now an old bylaw. It's no longer in effect. And to use this diagram, we had this in our bylaw that would kind of explain that if you had, um, you know, an existing house already set here, well, this house wouldn't have to meet the 30 meters. It could kind of basically go back halfway. With working with the county today, they are looking at uh, setback permits. So anytime we have development proposed within 45 meters of the center line, we refer the applicant to the United Counties for them to review. If they're less than 30 meters, the county now has a policy approved by county council that's different or newer that allows administration to issue permits. And if they get so close to the county or to the county road, then it's a point where they actually bring it to county council for review or approval. So we're actually removing all of this section because it no longer applies. And in fact, we haven't been enforcing it for quite some time because it was inconsistent with the county's bylaw. Therefore, the new wording is going to read, the setback for all lots abutting a county road shall be in accordance with the standards set by the United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry, and the provisions contained with this bylaw. So it'll be that simple. It'll be much, um, much more accommodating. Another section of the bylaw that we haven't been uh, enforcing for a little while is in our part 3.397G, water courses. So this section deals with uh, the location and the regulations of boathouses and docks. And the sentence that we're proposing to remove is a maximum length of seven and one half meters beyond the shoreline for boathouses and a dock or wharf must not exceed more than five meters beyond the high water mark and the maximum width must not exceed one and one half meters. One of the reasons why we're removing this is a, a, a couple of reasons. The Ministry of Natural Resources now only issues permits for boats or boathouses or docks that exceed 15 square meters. So the province became more flexible. We're actually more restrictive than the province. And that doesn't make any sense because we don't issue permits for boats 
or boat houses or docks. So it, it's too inconsistent. Also, we um, do not, we're working with the Conservation Authority, we're not monitoring the high water mark all the time. And we've also come across situations in our waterfront where these maximum lakes, lengths and widths don't work because we have areas of our waterfront where it's very shallow at the shoreline, so they need a much longer dock to be able to park their boat, or they need a, need a much longer boathouse to, to get enough water depth to get their boat in. And then we have areas of the water where it's very deep along the shoreline and they, they don't even have to go this large. So it just makes sense to remove it and it'll make for a cleaner provision in the bylaw. Another um, areas that we're proposing to change is a few properties uh, in the township. So um, council has been involved with discussions regarding this land that we own in Green Valley. This land used to be used as um, an open space passive park, had a couple of soccer nets for kids, and it wasn't large enough to be truly a, a, a true soccer field. And so our council has declared, declared this property a surplus. And so we're now changing uh, the zoning to residential two from open space. And that residential two will support um, future <coughs> residential development. This is another property that is, um, I pulled into the housekeeping amendment because it's been impacted by the recent official plan amendments uh, completed by the province of Ontario. So as you will recall, the province Sorry, has changed right. many properties from agricultural to rural and rural to agricultural. Well, a property owner in this location has recently applied for a severance and the property was previously designated and zoned agriculture, which wouldn't support a severance. But because the province has now permitted this property to be designated rural, severances are permitted. Therefore, we need to do a zoning change to bring it into the rural zone. We also have uh, another property that's located on Taya Town Road. This intersection right here is Taya Town and Boundary. This property is known as the Mardell property. Right here is uh, Progress, Progress Square. Um, we have um, Marla Mechanical in here and a couple of other businesses. This property has recently gone through a severance process. You'll see in here, this is all uh, floodplain in the blue. And this was floodplain holding. But one of the conditions that the county imposed with the approved severance was also to place the commercial property in a holding symbol as well because there's no guarantee that it can be developed. Um, I was kind of opposing the, the condition because it meant that it would need a site-specific zoning amendment. It would hold up the severance for an additional three to four months to go through it. But the county agreed uh, to allow us to include it in a, a housekeeping amendment. And this severance was only approved at the end of 2021. So we're pulling uh, that into the amendment. This property, I can't read that, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I'm correct here. So this property on this slide and on the next slide, um, you'll see on this slide it's yellow and you'll see on this side, this one's um, pink for commercial. So yellow means residential too, the pink means commercial. They were actually mapped incorrectly. This property is actually the property in Lancaster that's known as the uh, kayak business. And, um, and this property is a single detached dwelling. So I think at the time of doing the mapping, it was just missed. It, so it needs to be the opposite. So we're just proposing to correct it. This property was recently purchased in the last maybe year and a half by the kayak uh, business owner. And so it didn't stop the sale by any means, but we really should correct it. And we did commit to, uh, to correct it. I was dealing with one of the local lawyers when we, when we noticed the error and we said we would correct it at a later date. So those are those two properties. This property is an interesting property. It, um, it's uh, zoned rural. It was created by a consent, I believe in the early 1990s. It has multiple units in that property, but never seemed to have been captured in the zoning. And, and who knows how or why. Um, it's privately serviced and it was also recently sold and dealing with the law firm McDonald Duncan in Cornwall they too said, um, you know, they trusted the municipality that we would correct the zoning to recognize the existing use. So we're proposing to bring that into a uh, rural exception 17 zone to recognize the multi-residential uh, multi dwelling. And 
Um, I believe this is the last property. Yes. And the last property is actually land that the township owns. So our council has been dealing with this property uh, in the village of Glen Walter on the shoreline where some of the property has been uh, sold, where there was existing docks, as well as an area of the property um, is now signed for uh, public access and will be appropriately designed for a future park and waterfront access. So it was important to correct the zoning uh, from residential one to floodplain holding and open space to truly recognize it as it being more of a recreational space. This will then support our recreation department with the recreation master plan in moving forward to ensure that there's corrected zoning in place um, to properly identify that, that park space uh, if, an, if approved by council. And um, I'm asking any members of the public to provide us comments by May 20th uh, of this, this Friday at 4 p.m. And I'll be bringing a staff report to council in the future. I hope to at the June 6th. It may not happen given workload, but it might be at the subsequent June meeting. And that's it. If there's any questions or concerns or comments, please let me know. And uh, I'll move forward with finalizing the bylaw. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that, Ms. Haley. Are there any questions of council? Yes. Just a quick one. Thank you, through your chair. <clears throat> On the the first page about the poultry, I kept feeling like the first line was written sort of opposite of what it should be. Oh, Not, that uh, could be. <laughs> um, that one, like poultry shall only be, per only be permitted within having less than 2.5 acres. So I keep reading it over and over, but it seems to me like you're saying you can only have chickens if you have yeah, less two and a half acres so hectares. maybe what it should say is is poultry can be permitted within the rural as opposed to only because you're right because if you're over the six point or over the 2.5 or over the 20 it's automatically allowed right yeah okay i can i can change that that's good thank you yeah. Councilor Lane. thank you through you um when you were talking about uh the, the on-farm tourism, the uh, accommodations. When, it, when you say that they have to have approved septic, are we allowing holding tanks at all or is this only approved weeping beds? And, and like, what other options? Uh... So the interior building code doesn't allow holding tanks if you have space to install a septic system. So there's no flexibility in the code and there's no amendments okay. to the code. So that's why it's required. Again, um, you can use examples of individuals that may want to have a composting toilet and then if they have a grey water system for hand washing it'll trigger uh, a, an on-site sewage system. It'll trigger a small system because of what it's accommodating but it'll still trigger a system. If they don't have either of that and if an outhouse is permitted as per the Ontario Building Code then they don't need an on-site sewage system. So it'll really depend on the individual owners needs and how they want to you know bring the tourism on the property and accommodate their guests thank you, thank you. councillor mcdonnell through you mr chair i guess to that same question as well as councillor langs uh is there any restriction to having more or less a full-time or seasonal porta potty on site to take care of that restriction or requirements yeah so so thank you for that question so it, it again it, it's going to depend on the on the use and what the building code says so if i go back to using the example of converting an existing building for retail we'll know automatically you have to provide full washroom facilities but let's say you want to build a cabin and a porta potty is permitted that porta potty can be there 365 days a year perfect that was just my question too councillor luck Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to uh, the second last category you had introducing new definitions. Sure. Was it agritourism definitions or poultry definitions? I was just wondering if you had a slide summarizing, because like in the, in the agenda we have the sections and I was just wondering if you summarized the new definitions that would be within Okay, so I, I can make that simple for you. There's five, and there's three pertaining to agritourism being agritourism, alternative accommodations, and now the winery cidery. The other ones are pertaining to um, poultry, and we now define what poultry is, and then we, we change the definition of livestock. 
So okay. just five. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a question, uh, Ms. Haley. <clears throat> the, uh, is there a reason why we're capping the amount of days? Uh, I think uh, maybe I misunderstood. You said it's 30 days a year. Oh. I'm just wondering why we're capping at, because uh, I know like uh, those yurts are popular year round and you know, you, we could potentially be limiting. Um, there are winterized. Right. So I'm just curious to, if, if there's a reason it, ha it has to be capped or um, it c can it be removed? Just Maximum of 29 the, uh, over guests. No, it was the, I don't believe it was that one. It was the one before. Um, 30. No. I just have to find where it's written. I'm sorry. I didn't take a note. It's right in here. No, it was in the definition. That's why. It's in the definition? Um, yes. 30 consecutive days or less. Okay. So the reason for that is because you're not creating permanent homes for long-term rentals on Correct. your farm property. Mm -hmm. So your farm property would have a farm. Mm -hmm. It's allowed to, or a farmhouse, excuse me, or a house. It's allowed to have a secondary dwelling unit already based on our secondary dwelling unit. Yes. But now when you add in these other types of accommodations, it's not meant to be there for year round. So then all of a sudden now your property has three, four, or five homes on it. It's okay. meant to be to accommodate tourism. It's meant for you know transient guests. So it doesn't. There's not really a cap on. You know, somebody could be there most of the year, but they just can't stay more than thirty consecutive days. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Sorry, I misunderstood. So you that. can come in, okay. stay there thirty days. Or you know, re-enter yeah. into another lease or leave, but it's not meant to it's, be your permanent home <clears throat> to accommodate. Okay. You know. So affordable housing or right. something like that. So I just yeah. misread that. It yeah. doesn't limit them for I, only I 30 days a year. Yeah, I don't think it does, okay. no. Perfect, sorry. Okay, yeah. that's good. So any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I guess we'll uh, move to adjourn. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Deputy Mayor Jaworski, seconded by Councillor McDonnell. All those in favor?